Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Solomon's Temple, 1 Kings chapters 5 through 7. Earlier in 1 Kings, we've seen Solomon's succession to the throne, that was chapters 1 and 2, then in chapters 3 and 4, his wisdom and his wealth, and now as we come to chapters 5 through 8, uh, that's going to be the building of the temple. Actually, the, in chapter 8 will be the dedication of that temple once it's built. Now, zooming in on that, chapter 5 is looking at the preparations for the building. Uh, we'll have the construction itself take place in chapter 6. We'll see Solomon's own house reference in a few verses in early in chapter 7. And then the ornamentation of the temple will be the latter part of chapter 7. As I noted, the dedication of the temple is going to come in chapter 8. Chapter 5, verse 1, Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend of David. Tyre, it's a Phoenician city up the coast, the way you say Phoenician in, uh, in Old Testament Canaanite, is you just refer to them as Canaanites, but we, th we think of them as a separate, uh, by a separate term, the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were an ocean-going people. Uh, they lived uh, right along the coast. Uh, they had these great cedars of Lebanon, which were great for building ships, and uh, they had used those to develop trading networks all around the Mediterranean. By contrast, the Jewish people uh, living on the coast to the south, notice there's no natural harbors uh, along the coast of Canaan. And so they saw themselves more as a coming out of desert people, uh, very much not a seagoing people, by contrast. Verse 8, so Hiram sent word to Solomon, saying, I've heard the message which you have sent me. I will do what you desire concerning the cedar and cypress timber. What happens is Solomon's looking for building supplies. He says in verse 9, my servants will bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place where you direct me, and I will have them broken up there, and you shall carry them away. Uh, then you shall accomplish my desire by giving food to my household. So it's going to be sort of a trade agreement. Remember, you can't just send coins. They didn't have coins back then. I suppose you could send gold, but instead this is a barter situation. Josephus, in his Antiquities, discusses the same story and the letters that go back and forth. And he says the copies of these epistles remain at this day and are preserved not only in our books, which he's speaking of the Bible, of course, uh, but among the, Ty uh, the Tyrians uh, also, inasmuch that if anyone would know the certainty about them, he may desire of the keepers of the public records of Tyre to show him them, and he will find what is there, sit down to, the, to agree with what we have said. Um, so in Josephus' day, and he's writing at, toward the end of the first century, he says, if you don't believe this, you can go up to Tyre, and they still have the public records that you can look at. What's also interesting is the uh, wall carvings that we found in Mesopotamia depicting logs being fashioned and taken by the sea uh, down the coast. I'm not, I'm not sure what, uh, where it's depicting them taking, uh, but it shows the technology of that ancient world that they would uh, move. Uh, remember, they didn't have trucks and they didn't have trains, so they, if they're going to move big, heavy logs, these cedars of Lebanon, they're going to take them to the ocean and move them by sea. And that's exactly what we find happening in the pages of Scripture. Chapter 5, verse 13. Now, King Solomon levied forced laborers from all Israel, and the forced laborers numbered 30,000 men. He sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in relays, so that nobody is working for longer than a month at a time. Uh, they were in Lebanon uh, a month and two months at home, and uh, Adoni Ram was over the forced labor, so he actually has a, a uh, worker who's in charge of making sure it all takes place. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. And so what this gives us, it gives us a very exact chronology. Now, I'm assuming that this chronology is exact, you know, 480 years. Well, might it have been 480, like 479? Or could it have been rounded off? I suppose that's possible. I'm going to assume that's not the case. And by doing that, what we can do, what we can do is trace back and get a time of when the exodus took place. Now, I'm, I'm sharing uh, Thiel's dates here. Uh, I don't, you know, I haven't studied the exact chronology to 
to try to do it. Uh, Thiel, in his chronology of the Hebrew kings, has done that sort of work. And so he looks at uh, the year 931 as the year of Solomon's death. That's pretty well uh, established, agreed by most scholars. Um, you know, again, give or take. Uh, and that that gives us the beginning of Solomon's reign, uh, five nine. Uh, I'm sorry, 971, and the Exodus, just counting back 480 years, uh, that puts us at 1447. Again, round numbers around that time. I don't want to say it's exactly that year when the Exodus took place, but I I think it probably is in the close neighborhood of that. Now, not everyone agrees. There are some who look at this passage and say when it says 480 years, it doesn't really mean 480 years or not even 479, but rather it's just 12 generations. Um, and my problem is that it doesn't say that. And so I'm going to go with what the passage says. Chronicles, for 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, is a parallel passage to this and mentions that Solomon began to build the house of the Lord uh, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Now, first, first and Second Kings do not give the name of the mountain, but here it does, and then adds uh, at the place that David had prepared on the thresh uh, on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. This is a story that was told at the end of Second Samuel, where David had offered an offering not in Jerusalem but outside of Jerusalem on the threshing floor. A threshing floor is always very high. Uh, level if you can get it, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but a high place where the wind blows because you're going to grind the grain and then uh, use the wind to separate the chaff from the wheat. Uh, evidently, there was one to the north of Jerusalem, and, and tradition has it that that Mount Moriah, and it's still called Mount Moriah today, you can go to Jerusalem today and still see that mountain, and that's going to be the scene of the temple. Notice how it's depicted in this picture. You've got uh, the city of Jerusalem, and then way over on the far right, uh, that would be to the north of the city, is where they believe the temple was located. Now we're going to see a description of the temple itself. It will be in three parts. There'll be a porch out front with two columns and then moving back into the temple we're going to see uh, the main hall, the holy place, and then there will be, I, I think there will be steps because remember the the temple is going to be built on a mountain and mountains aren't necessarily flat on top, and, and this one is no exception. So you're going up to the very peak of the mountain, and that's where your most holy place, the way you say that in Hebrew, is the Holy of Holies, uh, the inner shrine of the temple. The dimensions of the temple will be like that. It will be the same general shape of the tabernacle with the exception that everything's going to be doubled in size. So if the entire uh, Holy of Holies of the Tabernacle was 15 feet by 15 feet. Uh, within the temple, it's going to be double. It's going to be 30 feet by 30 feet. Of course, in the Bible, it's giving us uh, measurements by cubit. A cubit is roughly about 18 inches, the distance from your from your fingertip down to your elbow. Uh, and of course, depending on whose arm you're using to measure, uh, it might be a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, but roughly, roughly we usually describe it as about 18 inches. And that gives us an idea for the size of the temple. Here's another artist's conception of what that would have looked like, and I think they've they've pretty well got it right. Uh, notice the, the on the left you see the the uh, porch, and then the holy place uh, where you're going to have uh, both uh, different different uh, ornaments and so on, and then probably steps I think leading up to the most holy place, which will be in a um, where its height and its width and its depth will all be the same dimension, making it a perfect cube. If you go there today, uh, you will see the uh, Dome of the Rock that has been built upon that place. And notice, to get up there, you have to go up steps. You know, it's, it's built it's on a mountain. Uh, it's relatively leveled off because some, some parts have been sort of sanded down, others lifted up. But you're going up higher and higher to get to that Dome of the Rock. Uh, now, this is compliments of National Geographic magazine. A number of years ago, they had this picture taken. This is inside the Dome of the Rock. The reason it's called that is because inside there is this, this major rock uh, that you find in the temple. Uh, and notice there's no pavement over that. That's actually the, the bedrock of the tip top part of the highest part of the mountain. Another artist's conception, as you approach the temple and notice uh, you have the temple structure, but then out front you would have a major offering, uh, a major altar, which is going to be used for offerings. Uh, and then off to the side, we'll see the, the laver of water. They're going to refer to that as the sea. 
Now, 1 Kings chapter 6 uh, begins, we already looked at the date of the reign, uh, and it's dating it uh, on, you know, by the year of Solomon's life and and uh, beginning of his reign. And then we see in, in verses 2 through eight, 10 the outer structure of the temple. Next, we have the covenant conditions that will be given in chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. The inner structure of the temple. And finally, the date of the completion of the work. So uh, the entire arrangement is made uh, uh, very, uh, very clean, very paralleled, uh, that we might see the entire story of the building of the temple. When it comes to the inner part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, when you want to say something's very holy in Hebrew, you say it twice. So Holy of Holies means the very holy place. Uh, the the uh, Ark of the Covenant is going to be the sole article of furniture, but on either side of it will be two larger uh, statues, wooden images uh, overlaid with gold, and these images are of cherubim, these giant winged creatures. We read chapter 6, verse 19, then he prepared an inner sanctuary within the house in order to place there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Verse 21, so Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary, and he overlaid it with gold. He overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished, and the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. Now you have the Holy of Holies, and this signified, this innermost part of the temple signified the place of the presence of God overlaid with pure gold, as we saw in verse 20, and God's going to show up when we get to chapter 8, and he's going to fill it with the glory of God. God's going to show up, and his glory will be manifested in the temple. This is a reminder of the New Jerusalem, which, if you remember, uh, the Holy of Holies, is, its length and its width and its height are all the same dimension. Likewise, the New Jerusalem, where its width and its height and its length, its depth, are all the same dimensions. That is, it's in the form of a perfect cube, although well, obviously much larger. Uh, and it also signifies the bride, the wife of the lamb. It is also made, not just overlaid with gold, it's made of pure gold. And we read about how it is illuminated by the very glory of God. In fact, it doesn't need any sun or moon because the glory of God is there to enlighten uh, the city. And that means that we're to, we're to see the New Jerusalem as the bigger and as the better Holy of Holies. Verse 23, we read, also in the inner sanctuary, he made two cherubim of olive wood, each 10 cubits high. Remember, wood was a very precious commodity, so these were extremely valuable. That wood had to be shipped down from, uh, from Phoenicia. Verse 27, he placed the cherubim in the midst of the inner house, and the wings of the cherubim were spread out so that the wing of the one was touching the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub was touching the other wall, so their wings were touching each other in the center of the house. He also overlaid the cherubim with gold. These are these statues, wooden statues overlaid with gold of these giant winged creatures that served as the honor guard for the throne of God in the temple. By the throne, notice I mean the Ark of the Covenant. That what that does did signify the throne of God. So I have the cherubim, which had been in the tabernacle. Uh, remember, in way back in the book of Exodus, we had the cherubim that were statues that were on top of the Ark of the Covenant. They were made of solid gold. These cherubim in the temple are made of olive wood overlaid with gold. Back in the tabernacle, they had been placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant, obviously much smaller in size because it had to be transported on the Ark of the Covenant. These stand on either side of the Ark of the Covenant. The ones on the Ark of the Covenant are still there, but these stand on either side of the Ark of the Covenant with their wings over the Ark. Um, the cherubim in the tabernacle face one another as they look toward the mercy seat. These cherubim, they seem to face outward toward the worshipers, uh, as far as we can tell. Verse 31, for the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood, the lintel and five-sided doorposts. So he made two doors of olive wood and he carved on them carvings of cherubim, palm trees and open flowers and overlaid them with gold. And he spread the gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. What I find fascinating is that we have exactly the same thing that was found in Tutankhamun's tomb 
where there was a large sort of a chest device. It was sort of a big, um, like a portable closet. And the doors on this, and this is what you're looking at, the doors had these two giant winged creatures and they were all overlaid with gold. Now we get to verse 37. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. In the 11th year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished throughout all its parts and according to all its plans. So he was seven years in building it and now, and now the temple has been completed. Chapter seven, verse one. Now Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished all his house. And he's still talking about his house. He made the hall of the throne where he was to judge the hall of judgment and it was paneled with cedar from floor to floor his house where he was to live the other court uh, inward from the hall was of the same workmanship he also made a house like this hall for pharaoh's daughter whom solomon had married and so notice there's these building projects first for the temple and then for his house and then for uh, the house of solomon of pharaoh's daughter he fashioned the two pillars of bronze, 18 cubits was the, now we're talking about, about the temple again. He fashioned two pillars of bronze, 18 cubits was the height of one pillar and a line of 12 cubits that measured the circumference of both. He also made two capitals of molten bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits and the height of the other was five cubits. So he's, he's building now the accruedments that go in and around the temple. These are the, the uh, columns on the outside of the temple. And these pillars of bronze, they're going to be named uh, Jaquin, uh, means he shall establish, and Boaz is the word for strength, so uh, God will establish strength. I think that's the idea behind it. And at the top of it would be pomegranates. Um, that is, remember the pomegranate was a fruit, but it was full of seeds, so it represented fertility. And here's this image of these two great pillars of bronze. Remember how you get to the New Testament. You see Jesus uh, being, described, being described in Revelation chapter 1 in this glorious vision where his legs are of bronze and it's almost as though he is the one seated at the temple uh, and imagine these pillars representing the very, the very legs of the Lord uh, who is seated upon his throne, uh, the earth being his footstool and heaven being his throne. Chapter 7, verse 23, now he made the sea of cast metal, 10 cubits from brim to brim. Notice the sea is what they called the laver. Uh, after all, the, the Jews would look at a lake and they would refer to that as a sea. Here they call the laver of water, which is going to be used for, for cleansing and ritual cleansing in the temple. And it's circular in form and its height was 5 cubits and 30 cubits in circumference. Chapter 7, verse 48, Solomon made all the furniture which, which was in the house of the Lord, uh, the golden altar and the golden table on which was the bread of the presence. So you have, just like you'd had in the, in the, in the tabernacle, you have the bread of the presence. Uh, you have the altar of incense. That's signifying the place of prayer. Chapter 7, verse 49, and the lampstands. Uh, five on the, remember, the, the tabernacle only had one lampstand. This is multiplied now, five on the right, five on the left, uh, in front of the inner sanctuary of pure gold. And, and these lampstands are in the form of trees. Uh, in case you didn't know that, notice the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold and the cups and the snuffers and the bowls and the spoons and the fire pans of, of pure gold. It was like having a golden forest that was there inside the temple because after all, just like the tabernacle had done before, the temple represents the garden of God. And so these are stylized trees, these trees of light. We think of, we look at them and we think of a trees or a tree of light and they would be before the most holy place um, and all, all covered with gold. Here's an artist's conception of what that would have looked like, both the tables of bread and now the lampstands, and all before the Lord presenting both light. Uh, and remember, Jesus is the light of the world, and he's also the bread of life, all pointing to the one who was to come. The tabernacle now, and that word tabernacle, the Mishkan, as you say it in Hebrew. Shekan is to sit or to dwell, and a Mishkan was the dwelling place. A number of terms that had been used for the tabernacle. It was also known as the tent of meeting, uh, the tent of testimony, the sanctuary. Uh, another way of saying that would be the holy place. 
And Jesus fulfills all of those things. Uh, remember that he is a dwelling place. The word became flesh, according to John chapter 1, verse 14, and dwelled among us, tabernacled among us. And he's our provision for meeting God. And the tabernacle pointed, it was the tent of testimony because it pointed to the saving work of Jesus. And we come to him through his blood. We come to the Lord through the blood of Christ. And so all of these pointed to Jesus, and they still do, both in the tabernacle as well as in the temple. But there's a sense in which we enter into that because they also point in a sense to us. We have become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And our fellowship is in Christ where as we come together, we meet the Lord. And we're called to be witnesses and a testimony of him. And we're called to be holy because he is holy.